Good morning, and welcome to the House of Progress Montreal, the first House of Progress in North America. We've been to Sao Paulo, Tokyo, Milan, and now Montreal, a city that is creative, innovative, and an advocate for the planet. Today, we're going to discuss a panel on sustainability. And we are doing it in this beautiful building, which is the first train station in Montreal built in 1884, which is a wonderful compliment to the future with the Audi Grand Sphere concept car behind me. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to our host and moderator for the day, Petrina Gentili from the Globe and Mail. Please join me, Petrina. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you. The mic is yours. Thank you so much. As Joseph mentioned, this is a panel about sustainability. And as you know, climate change is real and it is on the concern uh, of minds of people, global leaders around the world, policy makers, uh, and just trying to figure out. Sustainability, uh, sustainability experts are really trying to work through and, and figure out how we can make um, Canada reach its net zero emissions, how we can have a cleaner future. And this panel has some amazing experts on it in sustainability that are going to help us uh, see what they're doing to drive change, to make a cleaner planet, and what consumers can do as well. So let me introduce these panelists. They are disruptors and leaders in their fields, starting with Juliana Greco. She's the co-founder and head of Growth of Supply, a technology-based company that facilitates the use of reusable food items. Welcome, Juliana. Next is Spencer Reeder. He's the Director of Government Affairs and Sustainability at Audi of America and a climate change expert who is joining us all the way from California. And finally, we have two twin brothers, Byron and Dexter Pert. They're the founders of the online marketplace Goody, which sells sustainable and ethically sourced products. So please have a seat. I want to start the conversation. Um, I thought, Dexter, maybe you could tell us a, a little bit about um, your company, Goody, and what it is doing. Well, first of all, we're so happy to be here in our hometown. So we didn't have to travel too, too far, but it's a great opportunity to be with everyone here. Um, Goody is a B Corp certified online marketplace that is in the home and home design space. Um, we really see the, the company as a marketplace that brings together great design products from around the world. And we're trying to develop this for a consumer that's looking to make a more conscious choice. And so it's really, um, I joke a little bit, it's a little bit like Match.com in the sense that what we're trying to do is trying to bring together the people that are really interested in making a more responsible choice with businesses and creators and artists and artisans that are in their factories and offices doing really great things. Juliana, do you want to tell us about your company as well? Of course, yeah, thank you. And thank you so much for having us here. Um, so my company is Supply. Supply is a reusable takeout container service. Uh, and really what we're building is the technological infrastructure to facilitate the use of reusable packaging across all channels that touch food. So you can think takeout, catering, meal kits, and grocery. All of that single-use waste amounts to a lot of garbage in our landfills and incinerated today. So we're looking to eliminate that with um, our technology. Okay. And Spencer, you, Audi is really rooted in sustainability and so are you. So tell us a little bit about what Audi's doing. Well, thank you and, and welcome everybody. I keep wanting to look over my shoulder. I've only seen this a, a few times myself. Um, I'm new to the auto industry. My background's in climate science. I've worked in government policy in geophysics uh, and why would someone with my background join Audi? It's because this car and all of the new cars we're going to be making after 2025 will be plug-in electric vehicles. We're, we're setting aside the internal combustion engine uh, and Audi has this vision of the future of really moving towards the future and putting behind the past. We are quite proud of the technology we've developed over 100 years, with the Quattro and all of the great vehicles that we've made, but we know that climate change is something that demands a sense of urgency. Uh, we can no longer rely on old technology. So I'm um, happy to talk about it. Uh, really excited to be here with innovators in other sectors because I think what we're all looking forward to is 
talking about how we learn from each other, what, how do we build the sense of urgency across all of society? So yeah, no, it's great to be here. It's a long flight from California, but Montreal is a great city and, and uh, I brought my young son and uh, really happy to be here. So thank you. Now, Brian, um, a lot of companies talk about their being sustainable and ethical, you know, but it's hard to tell if they're walking the walk or this is just talk. How do you determine which companies are sustainable and ethically sourced when it comes to your marketplace? Yeah, well, I mean, for us, uh, and again, I guess I'm, I'm super excited to be here as well, too. Um, we took an interesting approach around the, con the word sustainability. It's, it's a broad word. I, I, I defy someone to have one singular answer. We've always been inspired by the sustainable development goals, um, specifically in our space, SDG 12, responsible consumption and responsible production, is key to what we do. Um, so our focus was twofold. One, to have that conversation be broader than just a conversation about carbon reduction, but also about gender equity, about opportunities of craft preservation. We, and, and we've developed our company to assess on a number of different areas of development with ESG commitments as well too. When you come on the platform, so we do that assessment ourselves. Dexter mentioned we're a B Corp certified company, but we were kind of bold to come up with our own metrics and impact management tool so that we could go out to all of these companies, see what it is that they're doing, and then also report on that and make it easier for the customer who's coming on the platform to know that there's a trusted destination that they could come to who's done that work for them. We believe part of the hardest part of this adoption is people are frustrated because they just don't know who to trust anymore. Everyone's able to say something, put a label on a package, but at the end of the day, I think for things to truly change, there are gatekeepers who have to take a little bit of that position, going out doing the hard, heavy work so that that information and education happen more easily. Yeah. And Juliana, you've, you've made change as well. I mean, can you mm. quantify, like, how many plastic containers have you saved from going to, to landfills um, with your efforts? Yeah, so to date, we've saved um, just over 50,000 single-use takeout containers from heading to landfills. Um, and really, the inspiration from supply is, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Dabwala system. It's based in Mumbai, India. But essentially, um, they are delivering 200,000 meals uh, every single day based on a color-coded system uh, to and from people at work. So it's really the oldest reusable takeout container system dating back 130 years. So it just goes to show how little uh, my company has done so far and, and how much more we have to go. So, But it's those little efforts that really trickle and make a larger impact on the world. Of course, yeah. It, it just goes to show how much opportunity there is. Um, and really, we're just scratching the surface with touching the takeout industry. Um, but, but by spanning that across all packaging that touches food, um, it just goes to show how big the uh, impact can be. But there's you know, also challenges that come with this as well in consumers, getting consumers on board, changing their behavior. You know, we are a society of you know, multiple consumers. I need to buy this. I need to have this. I need to have this. Uh, how do you change that mindset? You know, we're used to getting Uber and different <laughs> food services a certain way, or even when it comes to cars, you know, we're used to leasing cars every four years. How do we change the consumer mentality so that we become more sustainable? Who would like to take a crack at that first? I don't mind. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> I'll start and then you can go. Um, yeah, I think for us, like it, it's very clear that there are a large group of consumers who really care about environmental sustainability to some degree. So for us, 70% of people would rather purchase their food from a restaurant who has sustainable packaging as opposed to one who doesn't. So it's very clear that the people are there who care. Um, but it's also very clear that, um, as they were mentioning, people are a little bit confused. You know, where do I spend my dollar? What actually will make a difference? And so there's people who care and a little bit of confusion. And so that's where important, it's important to have sustainable business models that make it convenient for people. And it's not too expensive, too. And then that way, like you're saying, it's very easy to order on Uber Eats. Um, it should be just as easy to order in supply containers, and that's what we're striving to do. Yeah, no, I, I, around behavior change, I totally support where Juliana was. I mean, at the end of the day, if, if people are going to adopt more sustainable practices, it's because it's going to be desirable to do that as well, too. We have a human impulse to, we, we 
are going to only do what it is that's going to that is either beautiful or it's going to make us feel so in, in, I don't want to maybe plug the car but it, you're not going to buy that car just because of its of its of its sustainable commitments you're going to buy the car because you want to drive it because it's something that's desirable for you you want to keep it for that reason um, in, our, in our case in the home goods world what we're looking to do and to promote is products that people will bring into their home that will add value, that will make their experience together with a loved one there and they are having dinner more nuanced, more with a deeper story. Because without that, that story and that emotional attachment, it's hard to get people to change strictly on because um, th there's, there's a benefit from an environmental or a social only aspect. It's a mix of both and I think that's key to getting people to change their behavior. And Dexter, oh sorry, Dexter first, I'll, and I'll then we'll go to Spencer. I'll be really, really quick. I think um, consumers have seen choice of, I want more. I want more, I want cheaper, I want faster. And I think there's an opportunity right now for industry, for business, to have a conversation around having potentially less, but better. And I think that that's where the di there's, this, there's this dial change that needs to happen right now where there's a value towards quality, there's a value towards design, there's a value towards progress and innovation, and it's our responsibility to educate the customer and the consumer that these things are as valuable, if not more valuable, than a paradigm that's around, I can deliver this to you in three hours. And I think this promotional environment of fast-moving consumer goods needs to change, but it happens when companies and industry and business and governments come together to say, we're looking at something that has a more of a long-term value as opposed to a short-term gain. And I think at the core, that's really the conversation that we feel is our challenge when we get out of bed in the mornings. Yeah, I, I would just add from an automaker standpoint, I mean, this is a, what we would call a durable good. It's something that should persist in the marketplace for a while. I think there's some unique challenges in more of the what consumables sector or things that are more short-term that are uniquely challenging, I think, and really need people like Dexter and Byron to reset our mentality around those. You mentioned the four-year lease term. People will then make that a car available to a used car buyer. So you know, there's a pipeline. But from Audi's standpoint, we actually have the benefit, <laughs> the great benefit, that the more sustainable choice is actually a better experience. It's just any of you, well, I'm just curious, we have some people in the audience, but how many of you have driven an electric, all electric vehicle? Just raise your hand. So still an opportunity for a number of you that have not, right? Once you get in that car, like I can stand up here and talk about the benefits of the vehicle. Um, my colleagues can talk about the design, but it's not until you actually get in the vehicle and drive it, how quiet, how smooth, how if you like speed and power, how much more powerful these cars are that you understand that this is the logical choice. The challenge will be around cost, and all vehicles, all new vehicles, are quite expensive right now. But Audi's perspective here is that there is no compromise. You, have to, you don't have to make a compromise to get into an electric vehicle. It's much better for the planet. It's only going to get better over time as the energy system decarbonizes, and we can talk a little bit about that later. But in terms of the behavior change, we're relying on people to be drawn to our product still, and to be more drawn to the, the better choice, the more sustainable product. So, you know, we've got these fantastic designers that are making very appealing product. And so we're not going to rely on the consumer's motivation to only do the thing that's better for the planet, as you all were saying, but it's going to be a more beautiful product. It's going to be a more appealing experience, a better driving experience. So we're quite optimistic about the future because we've got product like this coming out in the future and we think that people are going to naturally want to buy it. So. But consumers still aren't naturally buying it. <laughs> At least in Canada, you know, the take rate for EVs is what five or six percent last year. It's still pretty small because there are not just other barriers, um, but there are barriers like infrastructure, lack of infrastructure in Canada that's keeping consumers a little bit nervous about jumping on that EV bandwagon. And how do you convince them to do so? Yeah, I don't think we have to convince them because I think it's your neighbor, it's your colleague, it's, it's now the proliferation of the technology, even in Canada, um, but in many places around the world. I'll give you an example, not just from California, um, but from Norway, and uh, people that have been to Norway know that they've made the investment in infrastructure, so now it's ubiquitous. The top-selling vehicle 
in Norway in 2021, not just of electric cars, but the top selling vehicle period was the Audi e-tron. Now that is a plug for Audi, but it is just emblematic of the fact that there are in those parts of the world that have made the infrastructure investments, the consumers come. Like there's no magic to it other than, yeah, people have to feel comfortable with the technology. So I think you see investments throughout North America uh, now on the infrastructure side. But I do think it is that the neighbor, the relative, the colleague, and then you drive him by and saying, oh, I can charge my vehicle there near my work or there near my home, or now I understand that I can install something where I live even. So I think all of these things are progressing. Just to give you a sense, in California, where I live, the month of June, the, you said five or 6% in Canada, was 18% of new car sales were plug-in electric vehicles in the month of June of this year. So we see this tipping point hitting, and, and not just in California, but throughout Europe and other markets around the world. So I think we're, we're on the threshold of a real breakthrough. What role does technology play, you know, Juliana, for your company? How important is it for sustainability and reaching our, our net zero emission goals? Yeah, I would say that technology, it's quite important. So just to say that. Um, but in order to have a sustainable and viable business uh, and a profitable business to, to present this to customers and it to be convenient, technology is that, that key piece, right? Um, so. What we're doing, we're in the business of the reverse uh, logistics and reverse inventory management. So essentially, we're giving you something and, and we need to get it back. And right now, really, the technological infrastructure doesn't exist. Um, it's similar to a library system, but dissimilar in different ways. So um, in, in our view, at least, technology is quite important. And the scale of technology is important as well. And so. In our opinion, um, it really requires a number of different players working together in order to make sure that the scale is there so that more people can access a solution like that. Is it the same for your business too? Yeah, I mean, I would say absolutely. I think that um, technology helps to inform businesses. I don't think businesses are built out of technology, but we're in the business of trying to solve problems for our consumer. We're in the business of trying to help shape their behavior. And so um, we're using AI-powered technology to, to sort of um, look into how people are, are shopping on the site, spending time on the site, what are they looking for, and, and trying to help them make better recommendations and personalization. So we definitely see technology playing a role in trying to assist in building tools for our customer experience um, from, a, from the standpoint of we're bringing goods in from all around the world. We launched our company in the middle of a pandemic right here out of Montreal, and yet 85% of our business is done in the United States. It's pretty cool, right? And of which half of that is done in California. And we, um, so you really see that technology has the ability to be able to expedite and amplify um, our narrative and our conversation. I spoke a little earlier about how education is so fundamental to what we're trying to do. Technology has become extremely important for us to be able to share our message, tell our story, and then give that feedback back to our customers that the choices they're making from the assessment um, of all of the products that we're building for them, we're able to bring that a little bit closer, to bring a more human element so that people don't feel like that information is extremely overbearing. I think it's one of the big challenges. You can't just present someone your impact report and tell them all of the things that you're doing as an organization. You have to help it work for them in the way that they already live their lives and try to expand on, on that in their lives as well too. And I know, Brian, on our call, you brought up an interesting point a couple days ago. We need to reframe the way we live. Can you expand on that? Yeah, no, I'm just going to just lean on something Dexter just mentioned bef uh, before around the technology because there is a, there's also a paradox between technology and the advancement of robotics and the like, but there's, we're in also a human economy as well, too, and Dexter was just mentioned that before. Um, it's very important for us that we're not looking at technology to be the only answers or solutions because skills, crafts, um, handmade economy, especially globally, if we look outside of maybe our context of the world, um, this is where development and opportunity and trade happens. This is where community development happens as well too. So I think it's very important when we have this technology com conversation, it's not at the expense of, of human skills and human opportunity as well too. Um, in terms of I think what we were talking about on the pre-call, um, and I, if I digress for, for like a second, um, when we started this business, it was actually ironic, the company's not in business anymore, but we were working with a leading 
well, the top tier premium department store in the US. And, um, and at the time we had a sustainable uh, accessories company and we launched it and it was, it's always done really well, but we started really promoting this. We wanted to tell people about where the materials were coming from, how it was made. And then at one point, we had the, the head of, of merchandising who called us. She's like, I know you, this is very important to your company, but this is challenging for us because our customer, they're not in, this is only about six or seven years ago, they're not interested in this. They don't want to have this conversation. And we have another problem that if we start talking about this for your brand, then we can't speak about it for all the other. We don't have something to say for everything else. So they didn't want to go into this conversation because for them, that was going to be challenging for business. And I think it, that's why I said I digress. Anyways, they're out of business. We've since left there <laughs> and started a business where we thought it was important, where makers who were doing this type of work could find a place that shared not only their commitments, but their values and wanted to promote and tell that. And we knew that there was an audience who was ready for that. We f feel, unfortunately, that markets in our industry, we were coming from the fashion business, it's built with this idea of conspicuous consumption, to continually have people buying based on trends, seasons, markdowns, it's, that's the cycle. And the cycle is typically, has typically been good business. And I think what we want to do and what we're challenging is this counterculture to buy something once, buy it for life, um, that is a shift in mentality for consumers and it will be a significant shift for businesses, but I, we believe that that's the future and, and, and a necessary change and evolution that has to happen. Yeah. It's interesting that we're seeing, you know, uh, um, you know, smaller companies, smaller startups, big major car companies, all grappling with the same issue around sustainability. So how do we go about moving that needle further and faster? Spencer, do you want to start us off? Well, I would say it's these conversations as companies like Goody and what Julianne is doing that, that drive our customers to start asking new questions. I'll give you some examples, things that we don't talk about because our customers, not enough of them are interested. So Audi was the first auto manufacturer to use an aluminum alloy that has zero CO2 emissions in the smelting process. It was a partnership with Alcoa. It's part of Audi's Vorsprung Dirk technique, which is German through for progress through technology. We want to continue to innovate in the sector. And by using the CO2 free smelting process that no one else had used, and by the way, in the industry, it's not something that most of our customers would even understand, but it's part of what we think we need to do, our obligation, frankly, on the sustainability beyond the, the product, right? Uh, it is the materials we use on the interiors. The more our customers come in to a dealership or send us a note and say, hey, where was your seat? Where, where were the seat materials made? Who was, who was making it? You know, those kind of questions will then continue to support those of us within the company, and there's many of us that say, we need to do more, we need to continue to press. Um, so I think it is these conversations that reframe the whole conversation around what a product is, what is its legacy, where, where did it originate from? I think these are the, all the right questions we have to answer because to address the climate change crisis, which is where my, you know, career has been focused. It isn't just one piece of this ecosystem. We have to think about the entire ecosystem. Byron, you looked like you had something you wanted to add. No, no, no. I, no, I, I, I think uh, that Spencer hit it on the spot. Yeah. Is sustainability a, a difficult question to have, you know, around the boardroom uh, with, with other, you know, companies to get them on board? That's a good question. I, I feel like I'm fortunate enough to say no. Um, right now, like my business relies on working heavily with two um, billion dollar companies. Um, and they have sustainability at the forefront of their mission moving forward. And I think those trends have really come from consumers and, and, and up because you'll see large brands um, that are coming to us unsolicited, asking how to solve the problem of all of the single-use waste that they're solving, they're producing. So um, I think it's, we're definitely at a time of momentum for the sustainability movement. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I'll say, I think any conversation around sustainability ultimately comes back to maybe a conversation around curiosity. And the reason why I say that is because I think that for a long time we haven't been curious enough and to Spencer's point we haven't just been asking the questions and so we just sort of do the easiest, fastest um, thing that we can do and I think what ends up happening right now is that, that 
consumers are saying and asking these questions and saying, why have we been doing it this way for so long? And so, and, and employees are asking that. And so I think that when, when businesses are approaching markets right now or approaching their teams, I think people want to be in companies that are leading with curiosity. I think they, so I think being in a sustainable business as we started um, our business, we launched it as a B Corp, which ultimately means that we're taking all stakeholders into effect of how we're driving our business. Um, and it's been important. I mean, I don't even see how you could be in a business or build a business model in 2022 or 2023 that doesn't really lean into this um, conversation about curiosity and conversation about care. And I think now people are showing, consumers are showing, markets are showing that they care more and they're more curious. And so I think any company that doesn't, you know, show up in the boardroom with a deep conversation and care for sustainability, I mean, is very much at threat. And so products and design have a very unique place in the world today where creators, designers, innovators could take this moment and create in an environment where people are more curious. And I think that's very exciting. And, and Byron, you know, you talked about ESG a little bit earlier, um, you know, environmental, social, and governance. And, and uh, how important is that social aspect? I know, you know, the environmental is certainly important, but what's the social? Yeah, oh, I, 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 I guess they're so interconnected. It, it, to me, it is one. Like, um, any environmental conversation is a social conversation. The, we, we could have conversations about um, climate effect in communities has a social impact on those communities as well and vice versa. So we do look at it holistically. I think oftentimes the conversation does orient largely around environment only. We saw, um, I think one of the things that's quite interesting, that two kind of big things of moments was maybe around Greta Thunberg and the climate activism and then George Floyd and Black Lives Matter happening within a couple of years. I think that this has heightened the level of an, of, a, of an understanding of intersectionality uh, um, in the last few years, of people realizing that um, things like COVID and then the effect of something like that, how that could have an impact on communities in a different way or how natural disasters can as well too. So I, I, large, I, I do believe that you cannot have a conversation about environment only or social only. They are intertwined. We're looking, and Dexter was just mentioning about industry, I'd say the same for banking and investment. This is, they're, it's very topical. There are anti-SG conversations as well, but it is very topical right now. Companies are making broad, important commitments, and that is changing fast. This ESG as, as, as terminology wasn't really used or wasn't in kind of the common um, conversation just a few years ago as well. And, and Spencer, um, what have you learned coming from California, you know, a state that is a leader when it comes to sustainability and an environmental um, issues? What have you learned in California that we can take in Canada and, and sort of learn from as well? Well, I, you know, listen, I wouldn't presume too much there. I think there's a lot of interaction, I mean, even in your guys' company between California, Quebec, other parts of, of Canada. I used to live in Seattle. I was very close to British Columbia, spent a lot of time up there, have a lot of friends. There's a lot of cross-pollination, I think, that occurs between the two countries, obviously, not just from proximity, but I think the progressive communities within each country are really trying to collaborate and, and link arms and try to drive us all farther forward. Fundamentally, in our industry, it is about, because the new fuel is going to be electricity, right? It's, it's progressively no longer going to be fossil fuels. And so the great opportunity is to decarbonize the energy system, to decarbonize the way we generate electricity. Now, in British Columbia, I think in Quebec, also the entire West Coast, we have the, the lucky geograph geographical benefit of having mountains and thus hydropower. So we have in this intrinsic ability to create a lot of clean energy, but that's just the luck of geography, right? That, let's not take too much credit for that, that we fact that we have you know, hydroelectric opportunities. So it is, what do we do beyond that? It is around zero carbon energy to generate that clean electricity because every time our energy grid gets cleaner, all of the vehicles immediately get cleaner, right? So there's that benefit. And then in terms of the human side, and again, not to get overly fixated on, on the vehicle, but it is so critical for many of our communities, air quality. In California, we have many communities that still are far below the standard for air quality, and that's because largely transportation. 
So as we electrify transportation, yes, we address the climate challenge, but we also Im improve the air quality for many of these communities that are suffering from asthma and carcinogenic sort of ailments and all of these other things that historically have been really a scourge, and not just in North America, but you look all over the planet where they're electrifying two-wheeled vehicles and three-wheeled vehicles in, in India and Southeast Asia. There's this great opportunity to improve air quality in many of our largest cities across the world, and that's going to generate incredible benefits. So, you know, I'm personally very excited, just, you know, independent of the climate issue, this human health benefit that we're on the threshold of, of realizing. So there are a lot of opportunities here. You know, what do you see as the biggest challenge moving forward, and what's the best approach to tackle that, that challenge? Should we start with uh, Dexter? Um, I, I mean, I still think the best approach to tackling the challenge, and Spencer brought up before Norway, I think in Canada we have a unique opportunity. We're uh, a relatively small population country. I think that changing behavior here, building excitement around concepts, whether they're, um, you know, driving vehicles or, um, you know, to Juliana's business, you know, the, the supply of some of the waste materials that they're using when they're, when they're um, buying food from, from different retailers. I think it should be easier to build a level of stickiness um, amongst the smaller consumer base that's not as fractured. And so I'd like to think the opportunity, and I'm always lean on the side of optimism, I really think that we can have this conversation in Canada where there's built-in diversity. I think there's a high, a heightened awareness that the world is at risk from an environmental standpoint. I think if we continue to deliver better optionality. I really strongly believe this. We have to give people choices and we have to explain the difference between these two choices. And once we do, I'm going to believe, because that's who I am, that people will make a better choice if they have the better information. And so ultimately, as I said before, I believe it's about information. I believe it's about better products and better quality. And I think it's about just building on what's already been built. I think we're on a movement right now. I think there's momentum. Uh, the worst thing that can happen right now is if we get complacent. This is the time right now to be able to bring innovation forward and tell people this is the time to get in. Julianne, I saw you uh, agreeing, nodding your head. <laughs> yeah, ahead. and we've had conversations about this before, but I think it's in addition to that, and. Funny enough, we haven't spoke at all about government policy, which we won't do, so we'll bore, bore everyone. Um, but I think it's really important for the government to be mandating um, all across the board, energy, waste management, some things in place so that um, businesses can properly innovate and bring in better solutions for all of the stakeholders who are affected by these government mandates. So for example, the Canadian government is set to ban single-use plastics come 2023 to 2025. Um, and right now, in some places of Canada, if that ban were imposed, restaurant owners, coffee shop owners, the best next solution is something double the price of what they're currently paying. So that creates a whole nightmare of a solution and really not a thriving ecosystem sustainably. On the adverse, if you have these sustainable business models to come in as a secondary solution for these businesses, then it just works harmoniously and we're able to, to kind of implement social, social practices in a, more, in a better way. Yeah, I mean, listen, uh, we, we had talked about policy. It's, it's critical um, and I don't think anyone has the perfect insight to know what the right balance is in terms of push-pull, creating the incentive, the disincentive, but it is critical. I mean, Audi is a supporter. We work in partnership with the government, not just in California, but obviously the Biden administration to drive innovation, but to do it in a way that allows us all to thrive. Um, but without policy, then the risk is always that you can operate at the lowest common denominator and things just get stuck. So it is this combination, again, it's not just one thing, it's the education, it's, it's providing people that sort of North Star about what, where we can be in the future, and not 10 years from now, but six months from now, a year from now. I think it's here right now, and it's those of us that are showing how you actually manifest this in reality in a way that's sustainable for a business, that, that provides innovation, 
Audi made a decision back in 2015, 2016 to make a huge investment in electrification. We're putting 19 billion with a B into electrification by 2026. This is a massive investment for us, um, but it's part of this idea that we can't be idle. There's a legacy industry that we're trying to separate from. There's all the new entrants, of course, that are doing well, but we're, Audi's made the choice to sort of separate from the past and really dive into the future, so um, we're, we're cut quite optimistic. But I think it is, again, just my final thought here, drawing from all of these things you're hearing up on this stage and engaging with other people in your world to say, how do we, how do we build in this sense of inspiration and optimism? Because I am also an optimist, even though I'm a climate scientist. You would say that's pretty unique. Um, it's pretty, pretty disheartening to look at the science, but I am optimistic ultimately because I meet people like Byron, Dexter, and Juliana that give me hope that we're all sort of moving in the same direction. Byron, I think you had something you wanted to add. No, I, I guess I'll just close with that. I, I think it's incumbent on us to keep the conversation moving. It, 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 in some ways, it feels like these are heavy conversation. Naturally, there's some fatigue that comes with it. But I think to Spencer's point, when you're together with other people, this could be your neighbors, it could be your, the, your, the workers that you work together with, your friends, and keeping these conversations alive, and, and that will keep people optimistic as well too, because we'll see change and positive development, and that's key. And, and Spencer, um, I want to talk a little bit about Audi as well. I mean, they're certainly using a lot of sustainable products, uh, recycled materials in the, uh, the carpeting of the vehicles. What's being done uh, on the front when it comes to uh, batteries and recycling those batteries and extracting raw materials? Um, because there are other issues there. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's interesting. When it, because I run sustainability in the US, either the first or second question I get is on the battery. and. I will answer the question, but I want, for all of you that are listening, I want to pose a question to you all. What's unique about an electric vehicle battery? Or is there something unique about an electric vehicle battery? We all carry around at least one of these, right? Um, we have dishwashers, we have computers, we have flat screen TVs. The point here is that everything that we consume and use has an environmental impact, and there are raw materials that go into that. This is a conversation, and the scrutiny being applied to EV batteries is important and justified, but we need to apply it to everything that we're using and consuming. And here's the, here's the sort of little bit of insight. There are those that would like to see electric vehicle purchases slow down. There are incumbent interests that would prefer that people ask that question and say, well, maybe I'm not ready for an electric vehicle. That's the cynical interpretation of that question, but it has been seeded by interest that would like to slow down progress. So here's what I would say. All of you that are interested in this, continue to put pressure on Audi to make sure that we're doing a good job on the electric vehicle battery. They will last 15, 20 years. So we don't have a big supply of batteries that need to be recycled, but we did just announce a partnership with Redwood Materials a few months ago. They're based in Nevada. They have a fully closed loop recycling program. All of our batteries, which are very few right now, they would only come from like a, a vehicle accident or some malfunction. Those modules, those cells, those battery packs will go to Redwood in Nevada. They break them down to the constituent elements. All of that raw material goes back into the battery manufacturing chain. So we have a fully closed loop system now established with Redwood. But again, it's not to brag that we've done this, there's a number of other automakers that have done this. It's to broaden the question that you asked to say, how are we applying that same scrutiny to everything that we use and consume? Because it is an important question, not just for electric vehicle batteries. No, you're absolutely right. I know we have about five minutes left and I just wanna ask each of you, you know, what can consumers do to improve their you know, environmental footprint and, and, and make an effort in that sustainability goal that we're all trying to reach. Juliana, do you want to start us off? Sure, yeah, it's, it's quite simple, really. Just question what you're purchasing on an everyday basis. Um, thankfully, we live in an in, in innovative ecosystem where there are other options out there. Um, so whether it's like the oatmeal that you're purchasing or a chair that you're purchasing, um, or takeout, right? So your dollar really does go a long way. Um, and when you spend with your values, um, that inspires others to create business, other business models. So 
um, just using your dollar um, with your value, I would say. Spencer. Oh boy. Um, let me ponder and, and let me listen to these gentlemen talk and maybe I'll come back. I'll, I'm going to go really quickly um, because I think I spoke a little bit about the consumer before with a lot of optimism. Um, I think a lot of times we, we sort of put this on the consumer, that the responsibility is on the consumer to make the better choice. Um, I think the companies are the ones that there's a massive opportunity right now for companies to, to pull, um, to ask their question of what can we do and challenge themselves to deliver better products to the consumer, to educate the consumer better, so that when they are in that choice landscape, they have all of the tools and all of the information to make that good decision. So, I mean, just to speak about our business over at Goody, one of the things that we've seen in the last year and a half is not just we're a direct-to-consumer business, but it's not just customers that are coming to us. Businesses are coming to us now, and they're asking, like, how could we work with you guys? And I love that, because now I'm seeing businesses probably because their consumers are making them, but businesses are now becoming more curious and they're reaching out to companies that are having this conversation fun fundamentally and foundationally and they're saying, how do we get involved? And I think that responsibility landscape moving from, we talked about governments and policy, we've spoken about consumers, but I think the real opportunity right now is for industry and companies to get involved and meet the consumer where I believe the consumer already is in their head. They just need to be delivered products that are going to last longer, work better for their lives. And, and that, there's, uh, that companies have actually thought of closed loop systems or circularity so that they're not just thinking about when did I use it, but these companies are coming to them and telling them about that ma materials that went into it and telling them that afterwards we're also going to take responsibility after the end of use. So I think that's an opportunity. Definitely. All right. Byron. Well, I'll just go back to the consumer because I, I do like the idea of collective change. And there are so many things we could do. And I, 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 Julianne, I think it was perfect. Just, if you just question almost every decision that we do in our daily lives, we generally know the better answer, whether it's running tap water. And our, like, there's simple, simple things um, that in our home, reusing things, recycling. Uh, one of the things that for us as, as a company that's critical is to think about how you could take a product and have it last forever. Like a simple, this is the simplest thing. And why would you bring something into your home that's just gonna have a temporary lifespan? So I think that these are types of things we could ask ourselves these questions and then the, the answers are probably a little bit there, more there than we realize as well too. So, so thank you for the extra time. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's just like I can see something in the background. Uh, well, I'm gonna invoke uh, our global CEO, Marcus Deusman, who runs Audi. Because I think this is incredibly profound. He said this now twice in the last six months. He, in December, well, eight months ago, in December, um, 10 months ago, December of last year, he was speaking with Der Spiegel, which is the big publication in Germany. But just last, this past week, he also said this. We have to decouple transportation from fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Imagine a global CEO of a major automaker making that statement. That makes my job a lot easier when the head of our global corporation says we have to stop using fossil fuels, period, in transportation. This is a major statement, and it is the North Star for Audi, right? So, so this is what I think is our responsibility as a company is to help facilitate that transformation. Anything else short of that is really a half measure. So I think in as much as our customers will then start demanding that, that's great. At the end of the day, I'll, start, I'll end where I started, which is we're going to make a great product. We want 100% of our sales to be zero emission tailpipe vehicles. And then we're going to look at the entire ecosystem, that everything that goes into the car, how we handle it when it's done. All of that is our job to do really, really well and be able to have great answers to the questions that hopefully increasingly come from our customers, right? Um, but at the end of the day, we want to fully transform our company into an all-electric company that does it better than anybody because we have to get 100% adoption to address the climate crisis. If we convince 15% of our customers who are really motivated to prioritize sustainability, we lose. Like, the climate loses. We have to get 100%. So that's our challenge as an automaker is we've got to provide people, everybody, people who don't even believe in climate change. We've got to say... They want to drive that car instead of the gas version, right? So that's where we succeed. That's our mission. 
and then doing all the little things in between. Oh, that's a great way to end the discussion. I know we could have gone a lot longer, <laughs> uh, but our time unfortunately is up. So I do want to thank everyone for joining us virtually and in audience. And of course, I want to thank our panelists. This was a fantastic discussion. Thank you, Dexter, By Byron, uh, Spencer, and Juliana for a fantastic discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to open up the floor to questions.